He's worthy, worthy, worthy. He's worthy, worthy, worthy. He's worthy, worthy, worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you this morning. We thank you for your presence right now. We thank you that you're in this room right now. We thank you that you're healing people right now. We thank you, Father, that you're in this room right now. We thank you, Father, that you're restoring right now. I heard the Lord say during worship, He's breaking disillusionment off of people. That there are people in the room this morning and maybe even by live stream this morning, you've been disillusioned by some things that have happened in your history because of the church. You're disillusioned because of things that have happened because of past leadership, wounds, those types of things. But the Lord wants you to know that He's always stayed the same and that even though people failed you, He's never failed you. He's never given up on you. The destiny is still the same. The purpose is still the same. The call is still the same. The gifts are still the same. The miracles are still the same. His faithfulness has stayed the same. He's never changed. He's never walked away. He's never abandoned you. The prophetic words still hold true. It doesn't matter what man did because God has never failed you. And this morning the Lord says that He's beginning even now to restore hope into the hearts of His people. That He's beginning to restore you this morning. That hope is going to become alive in you. Zechariah says return to the stronghold you prisoners of hope. This morning the chains of bondage of past hurts and wounds are about to fall off but you're going to be shackled to hope this morning. You're going to be held firm in hope this morning, says the Lord, that I'm going to cause you to have all the years that things were stolen, restored, that I've prepared for you things that you can't imagine. And this morning the Lord says that even healing's coming into your body this morning. Healing, the Lord's healing the rhythm of hearts this morning. Hearts that have been out of beat, out of rhythm, are being healed right now by the Spirit of God. Right now there are backs being healed. Muscles are being healed right now. The Lord says even begin right now to cause yourself to see the miracle that you've been waiting for. That that which has been invisible is about to become visible, says the Lord. And if you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible, says the Lord. If you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. Begin to see the way I see things, for my ways aren't your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Yes, they're even higher, but if you'll begin to understand that I am calling you up to see things from my perspective, then you'll begin to see the breakthrough that you've been waiting for, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you right now that breakthrough's in the room. We thank you right now that healing is in the room because the healer is in the room. That breakthrough himself is in the room this morning. We thank you, Father, right now. I declare that breakthrough is coming to your house this morning. I declare that breakthrough's coming to your house this morning. I declare it. I decree it that breakthrough is coming to your house this morning. And if you believe the Lord, if you agree with God, why don't you just lift up a shout of praise? Why don't you raise up a voice of victory and declare it done in the mighty name of Jesus? We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Why don't you turn and high five somebody and say, Breakthrough's mine. Breakthrough's mine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As you take your seats, Hallelujah. I want to say that to you again this morning. Breakthrough's yours. Breakthrough's yours. I sense it in my spirit this morning that there is breakthrough coming to families. That there have been situations and scenarios in families where there's been a, a, a divisive spirit. And the Lord says that He's beginning to deal with the divisive spirit. That He's going to cause the offenses that even some of you are carrying this morning towards family. God says, I'm going to cause healing to come to your own heart so that you can begin to be an agent of reconciliation. That's who we're called to be. We're called to be agents of reconciliation. And in a world that says just cut them off and throw them away, Jesus came to the cross to say, no, I'm going to pull them close and restore them. 
That's who we're supposed to be as the church. We're not supposed to be people who discard people. We're supposed to be agents of reconciliation. And I think that too many of us have bought the lie that we just need to throw people away. And that's not the gospel. Hallelujah. That's not the message this morning. Turn in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Hallelujah. We're going to get into the Word this morning. Hallelujah. I just sense the presence of God, and I'm so thankful that he, He's in the room because the truth is I couldn't do it without Him. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So good to see our sister this morning. And the Lord wants you to know that the dream you had for years, this dream that you've carried in your heart, that you've even at times thought, no, the dream has died. It's not possible in these latter years. The Lord says, I'm going to cause that dream to come to fruition. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restore your body, says the Lord, and I'm going to cause you to come into the fullness of the dream. The dream has not died. It's just been germinating in the soil. You need to know that the dream has not died. It's just been germinating in that place. And unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. And so it's not death unto death. It's death unto life. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, don't you love Jesus this morning? Don't you love Jesus? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says this, And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of mankind, but on the power of God. I could preach a whole message on verse 5 right there, that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of mankind, but on the power of God. Our faith should rest on the power of God. Not on the wisdom of mankind, but that's not the message for this morning. Verse 6, Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age have understood, for if they understood it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which I have not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the human heart, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among people knows the thoughts of a person except the spirit of the person that is in him? So also the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. I want to talk for today and next Sunday all that God has prepared for us. Because I think we are in a a pivotal season. Uh, I know for Anna and I, we feel like we are in a pivotal season personally. And I feel for us as a church, we are in a pivotal season where we need to raise our faith standard. You know, there is no challenge that we face that doesn't require faith. And, and the kingdom of God is a faith kingdom. It's, it's not a kingdom of man that, that operates by man's wisdom as we just read. But rather, our faith rests on the power of God. And the, the kingdom of God operates by faith. The resources of God's kingdom are accessed by faith. The the realities of the kingdom are realized by faith. And faith is the controlling dynamic of the kingdom of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, is what the writer of Hebrews says. And so I want to look at one more passage this morning. We're going to cover a lot of scripture, but I want to, to cover one more in detail. Mark 11, 22 says this, and Jesus answered, saying to them, this is right after he's cursed the fig tree. He, he's cursed this fig tree, and the disciples are, specifically Peter, says, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered. And Jesus answers them and says, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted unto you. It's such an interesting paradox for the believer when we approach this passage. 
Because we've been taught for years, especially if you grew up in the Word of Faith movement, if you grew up in any type of of charismatic movement, you know, you've heard phrases like, the Word works if you work the Word, right? Anyone ever heard that before? I know I've probably said it before. Or, Or these ideas, just have faith in God. Whatever you ask, you shall have. And and it's an interesting dynamic when we really approach this this scripture because I think so many have kind of peddled this scripture as a way to build their own kingdom, if we're going to be perfectly honest, that it's been misused in a lot of faith circles as a way to build your own wealth or to to build your own name or to build your own platform. And I I really want to examine this because it's an interesting dynamic. It says that if you have faith, whoever says to this mountain... So mountains, obstacles, things so large and overwhelming in our lives by faith are removed. That's what it says, right? Don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what is going to happen will happen. And yet for so many of us, our reality is inconsistent with this. If we were to be perfectly honest and really let down some of our walls, because we've been taught for so long, you got to fake it till you make it, right? And then I think so, so often... We fake it so much we start believing the fake and we never deal with the real. We never deal with the issues on the inside that actually cause us to lack faith. And so our reality is is inconsistent and so we, we try harder. We confess harder. We say it a thousand times a day and we write it down. And I was ministering to someone this week and they said, well, I've taken up scripting. I said, what is scripting? I mean, I'm finding out all these things all the time. Well, it's where you write something down a thousand times. And by the, thousand, by the time you've written it down a thousand times, it should come to pass. What in the world? This new age garbage. So we, we confess harder. We, we positively speak more. We decree. We declare. We demand. We rebuke. You know, all the things, right? We do all these things. And we wear ourselves out. And as though the louder we shout, the more demand will mean the mountains come out. You know, I remember I was ministering at a conference one time and they said, Brother Jacob, we need you to come to the back. We've got a real demon back there. <laughs> okay. So I went to the back and, and, and here's this, this, this woman manifesting a demon. She needed deliverance. And I'm praying and I'm contending and I'm rebuking and I'm declaring and I'm demanding and I'm wearing myself out. And this little old intercessor in the corner, just a little tiny lady, she just walks over. I'm just going to use the example. And she just goes, come out. Demon comes right out. (laughs) And I had been pushing and pulling and rebuking and shouting and praying in tongues and praying in English and praying in any language that I could figure out to try and get rid of this demon. And nothing had happened. Because we, we have this idea that if we just try harder, we can make it happen, right? But there was something I learned in that moment about her authority. She had already rested in the fact that she had authority. She was resting in truth. And and so when we're looking at this passage, we we read this, Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you've received them, they will be granted unto you. So when I don't get all things, maybe my approach needs some reconsidering. Because the word of God stands true. The problem isn't with the passage. The problem is not with the Word of God. Maybe the problem is our understanding of the Word of God. And so the passage revolves around one major statement in understanding. All things for which you pray and ask, believe you have received them. And so I want to think about those all things for a moment. Because all things, well, I may have many things that are all things in my heart, you know? Like holiday house, all the money I could ever want. Many private matters of desire. All these things that we, we, we dream up. And, and we're taught to dream up, right? We're taught to dream up. You know, create your vision board. Do all these things. And listen, I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things. But obviously, all things doesn't mean all things in this context because there are things that we could pray and ask for that are simply sinful things. If all things were really all things in our human context then we would have all things, right? If that's what the Word of God says, all things, then that would mean all things. But all things doesn't really mean all things because here's what 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says. This is the confidence which we have before Him that if we ask anything according to His will, 
He hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we've asked from him. Add another layer to that, James 4, 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. If there was ever a more glaring scripture to come to face with in our Western thinking and our prosperity mindset, it would be that one right there. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. The issue, the all things is surrounded by not doubt in his heart, believes, believe that you've received him. So it's all surrounded by that. And the faith here is the faith that has impacted the heart. That's what the faith is there. It's faith that has transformed our heart. It's already received in the inside of us. And faith is an expression of what we believe on the inside. The all things are the things in the heart, the things that God has placed in your heart. 1 Corinthians 2.9, we read it. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. I want to break this down. Eyes have not seen. The natural eye, things not seen, things that we have never laid our eyes on before, things we've never heard before, things specifically for me. God has things set apart for you and for me that we have never seen with our eye, we've never heard with our ear, and have not yet entered into the heart of man what he has prepared for us. My things that can never be yours because God has prepared them for me. Your things that God has prepared for you because God has prepared them for you. And so we have this idea in our mind of what all things are there, but the context is, is that when we pray according to His will and faith has actually impacted our heart, the things that we begin to pray for are actually the things that God had already prepared for us, and he's simply looking for us to come into agreement with the plan he's already set in motion for our life. And it transforms the way that we view things. It transforms our mindset. It transforms the way we pray because we're no longer praying out of those selfish motives to spend it on our own pleasures, but we're praying from the heart of the Father for us. When I understand that my Father wants the best for me, then I begin to pray out of His heart for me. And His definition of best doesn't always match my definition of best, but in the end, it makes me more like Him. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you've received them and they will be granted to you. Here they are. Here are the things, the all things. Things may be not seen yet. Things may be not heard yet. Things for which we pray and ask. Things yet to enter the heart. Things yet to be in the heart that I can believe because they are things God put there. And when God puts them there, there's already an ability to believe and have faith for things. See, Pastor Hector who I wish was here because he'd really get a kick out of this story, was sitting in my office one time, and he said this to me, Pastor Jacob, you have an unhealthy relationship with money. Ouch! Why would you say that, Hector? And he said, well, and he went on this whole story, and he says, you're praying actually not from the right perspective when it comes to finances because you have a fear of lack of finances. And so when you're praying for God to provide, you're praying out of a fear that he won't actually do it. And you're praying out of this selfish motivation to deal with things that aren't actually there. Oh, wow. And then all of a sudden, God begins to expose things in our hearts, right? That's what this is all about, is that God wants to expose those things in our heart to make us more like him because when that happens, I begin to pray for the things that he actually prepared and set apart, specifically designed for me and put aside for me. So many people reaching out for the things others have got from God. Oh, I would like that ministry. Oh, I'd like to have that anointing, that ability in God. If only God did that for me. But their things are not your things because God has your things perfectly designed to fit and satisfy you. It's those things for which we pray and ask. And we believe we have them because they're given by God, placed in the heart by God. 
See, there are prophetic words that are specifically for you to fulfill that I can't fulfill, that Shelley can't fulfill, that Mike can't fulfill, because until you begin to pray for the things God has set apart for you, you will only begin to walk in envy and jealousy of what other people have, and you'll never enter into, and you pray out of the wrong motives because you want what they have and not what God has for you. 1 Corinthians 2.10 For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Things. Now as an English teacher, I hate that word. I take my big red pen, and any time I see the word things, I put it right through it. I was reading a rough draft of a research paper this last week. It had the word things 23 times. I, I was beginning to get angry as I was reading. Why have they used the word things so many times? So I'm breaking my rule this morning by using things quite a bit. Because there are things yet to be revealed. Because I can't specify what your things are. And I can only specify what my things are. The Spirit of God is searching the depths of God right now for your things. There is this operation of the Holy Spirit searching out God's heart for what is yours, going deep into the realm of the Spirit to find your things. The Spirit is searching all things, even the depths of God, to pull up what God has prepared for you. It's like the internet, Google. You search for something and you get millions of potential results, but only maybe one or two of those results are what you're looking for. Isn't that true? I was searching for a name the other day, and I mean, I got pages and pages. It was on page 13 of these search results that I finally found what I was looking for. Because there's many deep things of God that if you will, the search engine of the spirit realm, the Holy Spirit is searching, and the search engine says deep things for Jacob Biswell, deep things for Mike and Karen Lauser, because the deep things of God has some deep things for me, some deep things for you, designed for me, set apart for me, that my heart can encompass and believe. Some of the most powerful encounters I've had with the Lord in prayer for things have been those things that God had already put in my heart and I see sudden results because I've come into line with his will and all of a sudden whatever I prayed for I believed in my heart that I'd received them because God had already put the faith on the inside of me for that thing because it was something he put there and so all of a sudden I come into agreement with the will of God for my life and I feel an anointing to pray for it and I see breakthrough and it's like whoa why can't this happen all the time because I've had blockages in my own heart because I'm praying out of the wrong motive for the wrong thing because I've not gotten an agreement with his will but when I get into agreement with the heart of God that he's already predestined for me before eternity ever began I begin to understand wow God you set this apart and that's why I burn for it on the inside of me that's why I burn for those things and when I begin to pray in accordance with his will all of a sudden there's breakthrough there's provision there's the things that I've been waiting for because I'm praying not out of selfish ambition but out of the heart of the father transforms the way we pray, transforms the way we believe. Faith all of a sudden arises in me and I go, oh, I can move mountains because I'm in accordance with what he already planned for me. I've never seen it. I've never heard it. It hasn't entered in my heart. But faith arises for the mountain to move because I've understood he already set it apart. Many people are living with broken hearts, unanswered prayer, deferred hope because they prayed for the things that God gave to others that they thought they would like. When all along God had in the depths of his heart deep things specifically designed for me that would satisfy me, fulfill me, give me meaning of life because I've come into relationship with the Father. That's why 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 12 says this, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so we may know the things freely given to us by God. 
See, the spirit of the world would want us to have things that maybe don't benefit us, though that we may feel they would be good, but often distract and disorientate us. One of the things that I had to work through after Pastor Hector hit me in the heart, Pastor Hector, I know you'll watch this, still working through that, is I had to begin to examine some of my own motives in life. Why have I prayed for certain things? Why have I interacted in certain ways? And see, when, when Hector addressed that, it took me on this journey of beginning to transform what I really believed about what I was called to. See, because one of the issues that I had is when I was maybe 14, I had a prophet prophesy over me. He said, by the age of 30, you'll never have to worry about money again. That's a good word, right? Who wants that word? Yeah. Then I had another one named Brent Douglas. When I was 16, prophesied the exact same thing. By the time you're 30, you'll never have to worry about money again. So what did I create in my mind? This idea that I'd be rich and wealthy by the time I was 30. Well, folks, I'm 31 and I'm neither rich nor wealthy. What did God want to do? He wanted to change the way I related to money so that I would no longer worry about it. And for years, I had distorted a prophetic word and prayed in the wrong direction. When if I would have taken that and prayed in the thing that God had in me, that I would never worry about money. Because God wasn't interested in making me wealthy. He was interested in making me peaceful. Do you get the difference there? That when we begin to operate out of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, all those fruits that I've never been good at memorizing, I begin to operate in a different way. And I begin to pray in a different way. I begin to pray the kingdom way that I might see His kingdom expand through my life. See, here's the key, the thoughts of God. The deep things of God for me. So know the things freely given to me by God. And therein lies the key to faith. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. There are many ways we hear the word of Christ. It's more than just the Bible. Now listen, the Bible, the word of God is our cornerstone on which we stand. We have to have the Word of God. If we don't have the Word of God, then, then, then we are out of line and, and we, we become crazy like the rest of the world. Because we have to understand, this statement was written before the Bible was written and compiled. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. So it cannot just be speaking of the written Word that we call the Bible. It's speaking of that relationship that we have with the Father. Each of us are individually called to hear the voice of God. That's the truth. And so there are many ways the word of Christ comes to us. Preaching, dreams, prophecy, personal Holy Spirit downloads, inspirational moments. I mean, I've been driving in the car before and all of a sudden something hits me. It's like, whoa, where did that come from? The Holy Ghost. And I'm charged with faith. Something is stirred within me. But see, it revolves around hearing. Hearing. And there are things not heard by natural ears, but by our spirit man, by our inner man, by the Holy Spirit placing words, thoughts, visions, burdens into our hearts that are transformational. Things for me, things designed for me, things that create a yes in my spirit that mean I have them in my spirit before I have them in the natural world. God put Texas in my heart as a little kid. I mean, I used to always tell my mom, someday I'm moving to Texas. No, you're not. You'll live in California your whole life. No, I won't. I'm moving to Texas. I know I'm moving. I don't know why, but from the time I was a little boy, I would say I'm moving to Texas someday. And so when the time came, there was already that resounding yes. And it wasn't just for political reasons. Hallelujah. These things I'm praying about are first gained reality in the heart before they are real in the natural. I mean, think about it. The person who who created the car, this, this beautiful, powerful instrument, where did it start? Where did it come from? The car didn't just poof, appear one day. 
It started in the heart. Designed, thought about, planned, mulled over, considered, and the heart began to construct in this mind a car. And way before the car's first sheet of steel was formed, it was conceived in the heart and mind. I mean, now it's plastic, but you get the picture. And then it was put down in paper and fully designed and perfected. The car started in the heart and mind of the Creator. You started in the heart and the mind of your Creator. Your life began in His heart. And so it is with faith. That is where faith starts. It starts in the heart. The Spirit of God searching the depths of God to bring me my things. And it is those things that I dream about and conceive and construct in my mind and heart. And soon I know I have them, though I don't yet have them. Soon I have them, even though I don't know I don't have them in the natural yet. There are things you are carrying on the inside of you that aren't in the natural yet, but you have them by faith because God put them there. Dreams, visions, destiny, purpose, because faith is formed in the heart and the mind. And then that faith brings to birth the reality of what I already have in the heart. So how does it come to reality? Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you've received them, and they will be granted to you. All things for which you pray and ask. The coming into reality comes from praying and asking. And the assumption is that you and I are praying people, asking of God people. That's who we should be. Now here's the thing. As I begin to close this morning, I want you to remember Joshua. God speaks to him. Joshua 1, 1 through 6. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. So now arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot steps, I've given it to you. Just as I spoke to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea, toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. No one will be able to oppose you all the days of your life. Just as I've been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not desert you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. The promise was the land. Full of enemies. The Hittites are there. But it was land promised by God. But this is the thing. God had already given them the land. You need to catch catch that this morning. He said, I already swore it to your fathers. I've already given it. You may not be living in it yet. But God is saying, it's yours. Land I've given for you to possess. It's yours. Go possess it. You can get it because it's yours, though you don't have it yet. Promised in the heart. An absolute certainty. All things in the heart. Promised by God. Lands to possess that were promised. To be possessed because being in the heart means it is already yours and now you go and get it. And right now I want to say to you, God is placing new lands in the hearts of you and I. Things that are ours to be possessed and entered into. And the only question that remains therefore is this. What are those things that he's given to me? What are the all things? Talk about that next week. But this morning... As I was praying over this time, and I already addressed some of this earlier, I believe there's a lot of disillusionment that people are carrying. Deferred hope, disappointments, questions of, well, what does God have? Does God have anything for me? Because I feel like I've run out. This morning, God wants to heal that. And as I was praying, 
I was asking the Lord, how do you want to do that? And I simply saw him putting his hand on your heart. So I'm not going to lay hands on anybody this morning. I'll pray for people later, but for this specifically, I'm going to pray, and I believe God's going to touch you. So if this morning you're carrying some disappointment, you're carrying those things, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. But if you're carrying those things, I want you to put your hand on your heart. Because I believe God wants to touch you. Spirit of the living God, I thank you right now that you're dealing with the disillusionment and the disappointment. You're dealing with those deferred hopes, those pains. And I'm asking God right now that you would release your touch right now. There it is. There it comes right now. The hand of God is coming to release disappointment, to release that pain. You may start to feel tears come. That's the washing of the presence of God. Disappointment go now. Deferred hope. The Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. I thank you, Father, for healing sick hearts this morning. That a tree of life may come forth. You are more than able, God. If you're in this room this morning, you've never made a decision to follow Christ never surrendered your life to Him. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to signify that you want to do that by lifting your hand. This morning, I believe more than ever before, we are on the cusp of the greatest harvest the world has ever seen of people coming to know Christ. And it starts with one decision. That's all it takes. It's one decision to follow Jesus. If that's you this morning, you might be watching by live stream or you might be in the room. You've never made a decision to follow Christ this morning. I want you to slip up your hand saying, I want to choose to follow Jesus. Maybe at one time in your life, you did, but you feel so far away from him right now. You want to recommit to him this morning, to following him. If that's you this morning, I want you to lift up your hand. You might be watching by live stream this morning. We're going to pray together. This prayer doesn't say Jesus saves you, and it's a journey of following him the rest of your life. This is a good way to start. We're going to pray together. Lord, I repent of my sin. I choose to follow you. Today, I receive every gift you have for me. I make the exchange my sin for your holiness. I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.